Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is the first in a four-part series on language and consciousness. Today we'll be exploring the question of whether or not our very thoughts are shaped by the language that we use. With me is Professor Steven Pinker, a member of the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT and director of the Cognitive Neuroscience Center at MIT. Dr. Pinker is the author of numerous books including Visual Cognition and most recently The Language Instinct. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, I have to confess, I have always assumed that uh, our thoughts are constrained by the limitations of, of the language that we use. Uh, for example, I'm very interested in consciousness, and it's always struck me that people who use uh, languages like uh, Sanskrit have, have a much richer uh, texture in which to look at the various nuances of consciousness and I know that you take a, a different point of view I think about language. Yeah I don't think we that we think in in language or think in words I think we think in visual images we think in auditory images we think in abstract propositions of what is true about what uh, and I think that a language is a way of communicating thoughts of getting them out of one head and into another by making noise. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that uh, even if you look at language itself, you see that there's got to be something underlying the words themselves because words can be ambiguous. So if you take one of those uh, unintentionally uh, ambiguous newspaper headlines like uh, Stud Tires Out, which was uh, in a New Hampshire uh, newspaper when they banned stud tires, but most people give it a different interpretation. Yes. The fact that there can be two ideas underlying the word stud, for example, or underlying the word tires, shows that words and thoughts can't be the same thing. Well, isn't it considered pretty much of a truism for people that, that different cultures have more words for some things that are important to them? I mean, we, we talk about the Eskimos, for example, having many words for snow. Right, and even that is really a bit exaggerated. Mm -hmm. There is a famous essay called The Great Eskimo Vocabulary Hoax, where someone actually went to a dictionary of the Eskimo language and counted the number of words for snow. And the first dictionary they picked up had the following number of words for snow. Not 400, not 200, not 100, two. Uh, now, that was a pretty stingy dictionary. And if you go to slightly bigger ones, you can come up with maybe a dozen, maybe 20. But if you think about it, English has a lot of words for snow, too. We've got avalanche and blizzard and hard pack and powder and sleet and slush. And we're not really that far behind the Eskimos. This isn't to deny the point that if mm -hmm. you're an expert in something, you're going to have more jargon words mm -hmm. for it. But I don't think it's that you have all these jargon words and you think more thoughts mm -hmm. or more finely mm -hmm. discriminating thoughts. Yes. I think if you uh, know a lot about something, you invent the words to uh, express mm -hmm. them. And I think the fact that we invent slang, we invent jargon, we invent new figures of speech when we need to, show that we have the idea mm -hmm. first and we think to ourselves, how am I going to clothe this in words so I can mm -hmm. make it clear to some other person? Mm -hmm. Well, language, of, of course, is more than just words. A language has a cadence. It has certain sounds and pitches and timbers. Don't you think these things may, may affect the environment in which we think? Well, th those are certainly what make for great literature and poetry and prose. And uh, artists and writers take advantage of those things to get across a certain emotional effect. And I, that's why great poetry and great literature is often very hard to translate, because even if you translate the meaning, you're not getting the, uh, the resonances of the sounds. You might have like a harsh staccato set of sounds in one language, and their exact translation might be something very mellow and smooth, and so you might lose that extra layer of meaning that resonates with the literal meaning. But the fact that you can translate it all, when you think about it, shows that there's got to be something other than words, because what would it mean for two sentences in, in different languages to be translations of each other, if not for the fact that both of them have the same meaning, where the meaning isn't exactly the same as either string of words. Mm -hmm. 
when we translate, we, it's obviously not like one of those phrase books where it's, how do I get to the train station, and then you find the equivalent in Hungarian. Because w if you know two languages, you can translate an unlimited number of sentences. There's got to be something, I think, under, underneath it. Something like um, a set of propositions that don't really have sounds, that don't have any left to right linear order mm -hmm. the way language does, but that is a, a set of we a web of connections between concepts mm -hmm. and that are also connected with other aspects of experience mm -hmm. with visual images, with body sensations. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if we were to follow that line of thinking, it, it would seem to me that one might say that a person who has no language at all could still think, could still have thoughts. And I think that's true. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, recently, uh, there have been a number of techniques that scientists have used to try to tap the minds of creatures that don't have language. We now know that uh, babies, for example, before they begin to talk, have a, a fairly sophisticated uh, understanding of the world around them. They pay attention to objects, they make predictions about how objects will behave, what will fall, what won't fall, what can pass through, uh, what, how people behave. Uh, babies clearly are making sense of the world, and that's before they're, uh, they're saying a word. Animals, too, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of good evidence that many uh, non-human animals engage in some form of thought, even though obviously they don't have the words. Mm -hmm. And even people with words, uh, if you look at the autobiographies of great scientists and, and authors and poets and sculptors, one thing that runs through all of them is that they say that their moments of inspiration often come from a, a vivid visual image and that they then have to struggle to find the words to express that image. Not only in the sciences, like Einstein, who, who claimed to have uh, come up upon his insight about relativity theory by, say, imagining what it would be like to be in a plummeting elevator and then to take a coin out of your pocket and try to drop it. Mm -hmm. uh, often novelists uh, will say that the first thi idea for a novel will be a, a, a scene with people uh, in the scene, and then they struggle for the words to express it. Yes. So I think that aspect of experience jibes with what the science of mind has recently found out, mm -hmm. namely that language is a very rich part of the mind, but only one part. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I suppose it's incontrovertible if you look at the biographies of, and autobiographies of creative people, that they describe their uh, breakthroughs, their intuitions coming to them in many different forms other than other than normal language. But when we look at babies or when we look at uh, other animals, uh, many critics of this research would say we have to be careful not to project, uh, to anthropomorphize or, uh, or, or to read more into the data than is actually there. Yeah, th that, that, that's certainly true and you can't just uh, look at a baby guess what it's thinking and leave it at that. But there are, the, the techniques are very clever and they involve indirect uh, ways of looking at, say, the baby's eye movements, what the baby is staring at, and uh, controlled displays to try to figure out what's, uh, what's going on in the baby's mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and babies might even be able to keep track of number. They might even do a simple form of arithmetic. They seem to know that one and one is two. Mm -hmm. And these are things that you don't just get by hunches, but uh, by seeing how long they look at various mm -hmm. kinds of displays and what surprises them and what bores them. Mm -hmm. You seem to be suggesting then that the mind has a language of its own, independent of, of the language that the mouth uses. Yes, right. Uh, so, uh, you can think of it as mental ease. Mental the, ease. The language of thought. Mm -hmm. And I think speaking is almost like translating mental ease into English or Japanese and understanding is almost like translating English or Japanese into mentalese, depending, of course, on which language you actually speak. But I think that's why we can understand each other, why uh, we, can do, we can translate, why we can uh, coin new words when we need them. Uh, if words and thoughts were the same thing, it would be impossible to coin a new word. Where would, it, where would the impetus to coin a word come from if you didn't have some idea that you needed to express? And also, when you're speaking, and writing, you uh, people often have the sense that they didn't express themselves properly. They'll say, oh no, that isn't what I meant to say. Don't misunderstand me. What came out wrong, what I really meant to say was such and such. Or when you're writing, you get frustrated and you, you tear mm -hmm. up the paper and you say, darn, that sentence wasn't what I meant. I know what I want to say, but I just can't put it into words. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something real behind those, that, that intuition. Well, that's a subtle feeling when, when you, yeah. you know that you have an intention that's not quite expressed by the language that you use. Uh, has that been subjected to rigorous research? Well, what has been uh, researched is the subtle shades of meaning that different 
orders of words convey. Mm -hmm. It's probably true that no two sentences have exactly the same meaning, even ones that are very, very close. Like, uh, oh, just to give you an example, um, I sprayed paint on the wall, I sprayed the wall with paint. They sound like synonyms, like two different ways of expressing the same thought. And the thoughts they express overlap by a lot, but there's mm -hmm. a subtle difference. Most people will say that if you sprayed the wall with paint, the wall's completely covered with paint. Whereas if you sprayed paint on the wall, it could just be a little dab in one corner. Yeah. And if, it's when linguists started to pay very close attention to the nuances of meaning of different orders of words that you discover that there's a reason why people often feel that their thoughts aren't being expressed properly by words, that even tiny differences in the words can convey very subtle differences in meaning. Mm -hmm. I think you've also suggested that the, the possible sentences that can be constructed are virtually infinite, e even though you know, the number of words and letters are, are much more finite. I, I think they're, they're literally infinite mm -hmm. in, in the mathematician sense that there's an infinite number of numbers. Yes. Now, of course, there isn't any room in the universe to store an infinite number of numbers or an mm -hmm. infinite number of sentences, but we can infer that in principle, the number is infinite by the old trick that you probably learned in elementary school. Your, your teacher may have given you the following demonstration. Let's say you think that you found the largest number. Well, I'll prove to you it isn't the largest number. I'll add one to it, and that's a number that's even larger. Right. And it's the same thing with, with language. In the Guinness Book of World Records actually claimed to have found the world's longest sentence. Mm -hmm. It was a sentence by Faulkner in his novel Absalom, Absalom, and it was 1,300 words long. But, and it began something like they both bore it as though in desultory flagellation or some sequence of words that I can't even remember. Mm -hmm. But I'll prove to you that that is not the world's longest sentence because I can say Pinker said that Faulkner wrote that they both bore it as though in desultory flagellation. And mm -hmm. you can say, who cares that Pinker said that Faulkner wrote? And someone else could say, Jeffrey said, who cares that? Etc. So in that sense, in principle, there's no limit to the number of sentences that a human mind can create and understand, mm -hmm. except for the fact, of course, mm -hmm. that eventually we die, so we can't process uh, literally an infinitely long sentence. Well, well, let me go back, though, to the distinction between thought and language. Let us assume for the moment that there is mental ease, that we okay. have uh, a way of thinking that is quite independent of language. And uh, you even have argued, I think convincingly, that, that certain people who, who were born deaf and never learned language were still able to uh, express thoughts once they were taught sign language. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. um, now, deaf people who have sign language mm -hmm. are people with a language because sign language is a fully expressive, grammatical, complex language. Mm -hmm. So the crucial case are those unfortunate deaf people who grew up without sign language. And occasionally they're discovered. And um, there's some in very interesting case studies looking at their conception of the world. And even though they're obviously cut off from a lot of our culture because we convey our culture through words, it's clear that they're, they have minds and that the minds are capable of some abstract understanding. Just to give some simple examples, um, one, one person could repair a broken bicycle locks. You think about it, that's not so easy. I don't know if I could repair a broken mm. bicycle lock. And it right. obviously involves a kind of mechanical intelligence, knowing what the lock is for, mm -hmm. knowing how the different parts interact, and so on. They can handle money. Money involves very subtle concept of debt and what you owe and mm -hmm. social exchange. Mm -hmm. They can pantomime their life history. Pantomime isn't the same as sign language. Mm -hmm. Pantomime is more like you know charades. Mm -hmm. They can do that. And so they have memory of their own autobiographies, which they can communicate. Uh, and when people first encounter a, a languageless deaf person, they often get a sense of the intelligence simply by the eye contact and by the nonverbals. Yes. So you really get a sense that there's a mind there, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just that there's lots that they don't know. Yeah. Well, so, so I think we you might conclude from that that, that there, there is a mental ease. There is a way that we think without language or words. But then we might begin to ask ourselves the question of, is our mental ease shaped by language, nonetheless, um, obviously it would be in the case when you're listening to someone else's speech. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, absolutely. The, mm -hmm. uh, certainly the contents of mental ease are uh, supplied a lot by language, by learning about uh, objects in faraway places and abstract concepts from conversations in, with other people mm -hmm. and by reading. So it's like the entry port into the mind, yeah. the, the actual sentences of mental ease often derive from 
language, although not, not directly, because we never remember ex the exact wording of what we hear. We remember the gist, yeah. um, and the gist is probably something like mentalese. And I think probably the, uh, in the evolution of the human species, evolution of language and the evolution of language and thought probably went together. Each one mm -hmm. helped the other. Mm -hmm. If you can think more complex thoughts, that puts pressure on you to be able to share them. And if you've got other people supplying you with uh, complex language, that mm -hmm. puts pressure on you to be able to have those thoughts. And you can imagine a kind of feedback loop mm -hmm. where each one helped the other. Well, surely in, in this conversation, my thoughts are being shaped by your words, and, and I, I think your thoughts m must be shaped to some degree by my words. Uh, uh, clearly, yes, absolutely. And so now I suppose the question is, uh, to what extent are, are we conditioned, is our mentalese conditioned by the kinds of uh, reinforcement that we get from other people in the culture around us? Well, cer yes, yeah, certainly a large extent. When we talk about persuading and convincing and uh, it winning friends and influencing people. Yeah. I mean, that one thing that's really true about human beings clearly is that a lot of our social interactions are by words. Mm -hmm. So we certainly try to get people to see things our way by, by aiming these noises at them, what we call language. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's basically, it's the machinery of the mind. It's the ability to have thoughts that's independent of language. But language is obviously very important to supplying the actual content of the thoughts, mm -hmm. I think. Now, uh, some cultures, uh, particularly in Asia, have developed, let's say, a mystical tradition that we haven't had w with nearly as much depth in the West. And I think that's reflected in their language. Uh, is it fair to say that the people who are raised in, in that environment, that linguistic environment, might be more prone to, to have mystical experiences? I'd, I'd be willing to bet that the, the experiences come first, and mm -hmm. that the reason they have the words for them is that they need the words to, um, to, to talk about them. I'll yes. give you an example that's a little closer to home, closer to my experience anyway, yes. since I don't know much about the, these Eastern cultures. Yes. But, but uh, Yiddish, the language that my grandparents uh, spoke, has many words for which there are no exact equivalents in English. Mm -hmm. I mean, the word nachas, which nachas. any Yiddish speaker will instantly recognize, describes the emotional state of pride and satisfaction uh, from, typically from a family member, most mm -hmm. prototypically from one's child. Yes. When, you're, when, when, you're, when your son wins the Nobel Prize, you experience nachas. Yes. Now, there's no exact English equivalent. Pride doesn't quite capture it. Uh, I think, though, having even explained it to you, even if you didn't know a word of Yiddish, you'd probably know exactly what emotion I was talking about. Mm -hmm. It's maybe talked about more often in the in, in Yiddish culture, but I don't think I've uh, I don't think I've expressed something that you can't even grasp, even if you never heard the word before. You probably know what I'm talking about. Maybe you'll even start to use the word. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that for some of the words in these Eastern cultures, it may be like that. I probably haven't had much occasion to talk about those states, but if I was in, in that kind of circumstance where I would experiencing, experience them, and someone said, oh, by the way, that's called blah, 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 yeah. I think I'd be able to use blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's a question of habits that, that certain uh, language groups ha uh, habitually cultivate certain states that then they like to talk about. I, I think so, and I think that's why the, the kernel of truth behind the Eskimo snow myth, mm -hmm. they, they probably have a few more words for snow yeah. than we do, is probably for the same reason that bicycle mechanics have more words for parts of bicycles and painters have more words for shades of mauve and mm -hmm. so on. A as you say, when you're in the habit of dealing with different aspects of the world and dealing with other people who are also dealing with those aspects, you're going to invent the words to uh, be able to communicate them. Mm -hmm. But I, that, that the fact that we can invent words is what makes me think that mm -hmm. the experiences come first. Yeah. But what, what about uh, the, the cadence of the languages? Like some languages, a Polynesian language or, or Japanese or German, uh, at times seems like it's very crisp, mm -hmm. precise, a, a lot of sharp vowel sounds. Other languages, the Romantic languages, uh, sharp consonants. I think other languages emphasize the vowels more. Yeah. And, uh, doesn't that create a whole different personality? I, I tend to doubt it, to be honest. Right. Um, I think that the sounds of language uh, change mm -hmm. without necessarily a change in the culture. English sounded very different several 
a uh, hundred years ago than mm -hmm. it does today. I don't know if the mind of English speakers has changed. Also, we know, think about the way that uh, different cultures adopt new yes. languages. I mean, the English language now is spoken uh, over huge parts of the world, but I don't know if it's the sounds of English have actually caused all mm -hmm. the cultures that have adopted it to start thinking differently. Mm -hmm. But I think where it probably might have an influence is in art and literature and poetry. Yes. Those, the sounds of the language might make it more appropriate to uh, express certain kinds of emotion and might resonate more with certain kinds of experience. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful line in one of uh, Woody Allen's movies where his, he's um, trying to seduce a woman and she says, um, say something to me in Spanish. Spanish is such a romantic language. Mm -hmm. And he says, I don't know any Spanish. I can say something to you in Hebrew. <laughs> 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 the, the humor in that is that there is something about the, the rhythm and the cadence of Spanish that, mm -hmm. that puts us in the mood, perhaps, of more romantic thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's probably the extent of it. Well, it seems to me that your message then is that our thoughts are really totally free, at least as, as regards any constraints that might be imposed by language. The, whatever modifying influences language has, uh, it, it doesn't anywhere impose a constraint on what we can think. I don't think it imposes a sharp constraint. I think it mm -hmm. does, I think it helps to think in certain ways for the following reason. You've got, as you're thinking a complex thought, as you're formulating an argument to yourself or as you're trying to solve a puzzle, you often have to keep a bunch of things in mind, sort of like juggling a lot of balls in the air. Mm. And if you can keep some of those in mind by imagining yourself saying the words. So you've got almost like a little echo in the back of your head. That's one more mental scratch pad that you can use to keep the ideas from fading. Subvocalization. Like subvocalization, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and if a, word, if a thought corresponds exactly to a word, you can play it to yourself in your uh, auditory imagery. And that, so w if you have a language that has words for certain things, you can probably keep more of them in mind. I know people who know sign language who often when they're thinking, who know sign language and spoken language, yes. who when they're following a complex argument, when they say sitting in a lecture or you've told them something very mind-boggling, they're trying to reason it through, they'll be gesturing with their hands even though there's no other signer in the room simply because the muscle memories of the motion you just made with your hands, mm -hmm. if they have linguistic meaning, are yet another form of short-term memory mm -hmm. that you can use. So I think that's a way in which language does interact mm -hmm. with thought. But it's not that you are incapable of thinking certain thoughts if you don't have the words for them. Well, what about most of the time? Don't most people report, if you were to ask them, how do you think? They would say, I think in words? Uh, they, uh, a lot of people do. Um, although, re remember, a lot of people don't. A lot of people say that they think in images, that they think in body sensations. I think that what you're aware of mm -hmm. is probably a tip of the iceberg as to what's actually happening yeah. in the mind. And words are the things that we can talk to each other about. Mm -hmm. I mean, how am I going to tell you what I'm thinking unless I use words? Yes. And so the, the thing that's going to be most uppermost in my mind, if I'm trying to convey to you how I think, are going to be things like the, the vocalizations, the, uh, the auditory imagery of words. And that's what we notice, although mm -hmm. I don't think that's what where the, the real um, heart of the matter is in thought processes. I think that's just the part that's mm -hmm. most accessible to us. In other words, it's, it's a, a consequence of the accident that we were born with mouths instead of uh, multimedia projector systems. Exactly. We, uh -huh. we use, we use our, um, uh, our mental imagery of words, I think, to, uh, as a, one extra, like, almost like a piece of paper that we jot down a phone number to remember it, mm -hmm. uh, but of course all inside our heads. Yeah. But clearly, when you look at the, all these ambiguous ambiguities in language, Hershey bars protest. That's another headline. <laughs> it meant that the town of Hershey mm -hmm. outlawed protest. Right. Uh, you, whoever wrote that headline probably d didn't even occur to that person that it had another meaning. Uh, he might have reported that he was literally thinking in words. But uh, if he was thinking in words, then uh, these, both of these meanings should have been apparent, but uh, there's got to be an idea underlying it that he had in mind that he probably wasn't even aware of. So you're arguing that the ambiguities that exist in language w would suggest that, th that they can't possibly constrain our thoughts. Exactly. I think mm -hmm. the there's, in fact, most of us don't even uh, realize how ambiguous mm -hmm. language is, and that's why it's been so hard to program computers to have a conversation. We think each sentence has a meaning. You actually try to program a computer to do it, and the computer will find 19 meanings mm -hmm. and, and won't know which one you had in mind. But those are uh, 
really below our level of awareness. Mm -hmm. Well, in a way, I suppose it's close to a miracle that we can sit here and have this conversation and understand each other, and thousands of people at some other point in time are going to be listening to some sort of electronic representation of this conversation, and they'll know what we're thinking. That, that's what, that is astonishing, that mm -hmm. people are just, noises are coming out of our mouths, and we could be narrating the play-by-play -play of a basketball game, or we could be talking about a soap opera plot, and they would just be slightly different noises, mm -hmm. but human brains are capable of unpacking the meaning behind the noises to figure out, in our case, that we're talking about language itself, but we could have been talking about anything. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, we've raised more questions <laughs> in, yeah. in all of this than, than we have answered. I mean, the, the mechanism of mental ease, the way in which the sub-vocalizations and, and the words and the pictures all fit together and interact with our brain uh, is, is a, su a subject of great interest that uh, we will explore together in the uh, future portions of this series. Stephen, this has been uh, an eye-opener uh, for me because I have to confess honestly, it's, it's caused me to change my opinion about, about language. I, I was certain that, that there were certain inherent limitations in the English environment, and uh, you really have convinced me yeah, otherwise, and I find that very liberating. And so for that, I thank you. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. We've got just a few uh, oh. seconds yet <laughs> be before we need to close this program. I might mention uh, for people who are viewing that we're, we're going to look more into the uh, mechanisms of how we uh, produce language and how we understand language. And we'll look at the evolution of language. And uh, finally, as, as we uh, approach the fourth part of the series, we're going to explore the uh, nature of consciousness itself. You have some very interesting ideas about the uh, uh, modules in, in the nervous system that produce consciousness. So Stephen, thanks so much for being with me. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.